We will be testing these thermoplastic materials according to ASTM 638-14 in order to determine the elastic or Young's modulus, the yield strength, percent elongation, and failure strength of these materials. In order to determine the elastic modulus of this material, I need to know the geometry of the specimen. In this case, I'm measuring the width and the thickness using a digital vernier caliper. These measurements I will use for the area calculation which I need in order to calculate the stress in the material. I will also need to know the initial test length or span which will be measured between the two fillets, but this will be determined when I set this specimen up on the universal testing machine. This is a TE universal testing machine. We will be using this for our polymer testing. Uh, similar to the Shimatsu we showed in the metals video, it has a crosshead which is, can move up and down, so we can do tensile and compression tests on this machine. Um, in contrary to the Shimatsu, the 20 kN load cell on this machine is mounted below the bottom grip, so the top grip will be fixed and the bottom grip is the one that's going to move. This machine also has a clip-on extensometer which is used specifically for polymer testing, um, and this will measure the displacement up until the point we, uh, when we reach the yield point at which point we need to remove it to avoid the clip-on extensometer getting damaged. Um, what's really important at this point is to measure the initial separation of the blades of the clip-on extensometer so that we can calculate the strain accurately. We will now start the test for the PVC specimen. As can be seen, the initial portion of the curve is, is elastic, and then we're going to get to a point where the material starts to plastically deform or shows non-linear dis dis deformation. Um, at this point, I need to go and remove the clip-on extensometer. And you'll see now that the material reaches a yield point, and then the load starts to drop off. And if this were a metal, we would now expect it to start necking and to start failing. But with the PVC sample or specimen, it will start necking. However, after necking and the, starting, and the start of the formation of crazes, which are small micro cracks, which give the sample its white discoloration, we notice now that the material doesn't fail, but it actually continues to extend without showing any decrease in load carrying ca capability. And it's this plateau area here, which is very common to a lot of thermoplastic materials that enables them to be used for applications where um, we need large amounts of um, deformation. And, and essentially what's happening in, in this region of the curve is that at this point, the material, the chains within the polymer are starting to now untangle and start straightening out. Um, and the resistance to them untangling is what we are seeing on the load displacement curve here. And this will continue up until a point where the chains are actually now almost straight. And then you'll see that the load's going to increase again. And eventually then bonds within the polymer will start to fail and eventually that sample will now fail. You can see on this specimen now that there is a huge amount of stress whitening or crazing and that it is showing a considerable amount of necking. So, essentially at this point now, the chains are now completely untangled and the bonds within the polymer have now failed, which results in the specimen breaking. I will now start the test on the HDPE sample to show you the difference in behavior between the HDPE and the PVC. As you can see, um, similar to the PVC, the HDP also exhibits a linear behavior in, at the beginning of the, of the test. Um, and it also reaches a point which would be called the yield point um, at which I need to remove the extensometer. And it's about to reach that point now. So at this point, I've now removed the clip-on extensometer, and essentially the, the specimen has reached its max load, and it will now start to neck, and the load will start to drop off.
can also notice on the specimen now a slight discoloration and darkening. And this um, phenomenon is known as recrystallization. Um, essentially what happens is at this point the polymer chains are starting to align themselves and untangle to a certain extent. And because they are now moving closer together, this changes the optical nature of the polymer. So similar to the PVC sample, we will see now that the HDPE sample is going to reach a plateau load at which it will now continue to extend at this load, but it will not show any decrease in load. All right, so we, we have spoken in class about the fact that the total deformation of a sample before failure is the sum of the elastic and the plastic deformation. As you can see now, this HTP, HTPE sample hasn't actually failed, but this is a good way for me to show you the spring back due to the elastic recovery of the sample when I release the grips. Um, in reality, because, this sample, because of the nature of HTPE, I don't actually have enough height here in order to test this sample to failure. Now, look, when I release this grip, you can see now it should spring back a little bit. You see that? So that little jolt up is the elastic recovery in this specimen. So here we have a comparison of two of the samples that we've shown you being tested and two of the samples that I have tested um, off the video. On the far right over here we have the Perspex sample. As you can see the Perspex sample did not plastically deform much um, and it actually failed in the grips and this is evident of the brittle nature of the Perspex. Our PVC sample exhibited stress whitening and crazing and it did exhibit a bit of plastic deformation. Similarly, the polycarbonate sample also exhibited a bit more plastic deformation than the PVC sample and it also had a bit of crystallization which resulted in a change in opacity. And lastly, we've got the HDPE sample which exhibited a significant amount of plastic deformation, so much so that we couldn't actually break it in our test because we didn't have enough crosshead displacement. Um, and that is one of the reasons why we make milk bottles out of HDPE, because it can be blow molded and stretched to such an extent.